All right, all right. Welcome back, guys. Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Claudia De La Cruz. She is a co-founder of the People's Forum, and she is running for president for 2024 as a third-party candidate under PSL. Welcome, Claudia, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm curious because there's been a lot of, you know, candidates jumping into the race. Why did you decide to run for president? And more importantly, why did you decide to run as a third party candidate? Well, um, I think it's important to say I, I decided to run within the Party for Socialism and Liberation, within the ticket of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And so I, I don't want to say that I came to the decision on my own. I think it was uh, organizational. Um, decision. It's something that we understand we need to do. The Party for Socialism and Liberation is a socialist party. And we've understood that, you know, democracy within the United States is a sham. That is a dollar democracy. Um, and obviously, it serves Wall Street and itself serves war makers, it serves bankers. Um, and in a real democracy, there would be many options for working people to decide where to put their vote in. Um, we've decided to, to do this as a way of exposing um, and raising what the issues are um, that neither the Democrats or Republicans ever pay attention to or even mention. And so we want to be able to, to do that work of mass political education. We want to be do, doing the work of encouraging folks to be able to join political organization. There's a, a significance to being able to to join a party formation, um, to be under a party discipline, to be a cadre, um, and understand the need to be able to take hold of the state, to be able to have the economic and political power to transform things from the root. Um, you know, we we are often told that these elections are the most important elections of our lifetime. And we're told that every four years, and obviously there's there's always something that is at stake. And I think what we've learned, um, if not in the last three years, in the last decade, is that it is a great opportunity to be able to remind people to reclaim historical memory, um, and reclaim the memory massively of what the Democratic Party have, has promised and not delivered. And not delivered, not necessarily because they can't, but because they won't, because they don't necessarily have uh, the working class interest at heart, as neither does the, Rep the Republican Party. And so that's why we, we say, you know, the ruling class and the corporations and the bankers and the warmongers of this country have two parties. The, the working class people should have at least one option. Um, and so it, it should not be an option that comes up every four years but an option that is working every day to transform society, um, to build the confidence of working class people, to take power and take you know, their destiny in their own hands. So that's, that's the main reason. Um, to build organization, to deepen the working class struggles um, and the organizing efforts that our people are doing everywhere across the country, and to be able to expose the dollar democracy that is ruling us and has been ruling us. I have to say I am in incredibly excited that there are multiple third party and independent candidates running this time around. Um, Jasmine mm -hmm. Sullivan has been on the show. Dr. Shiva has been here. Cornell West has been here. Uh, now you, I think Davi's also going to be coming onto the show as well. A number of third party independent candidates. And I think this is needed to really shake up the duopoly, so to speak, but one of the problems that third party and independent candidates run into is the ballot access, right? So when right. Dr. West was here, I talked to him about the same thing with the Green Party. How many states are they on in reference to uh, ballot access? How many states Jill Stein was able to get going through the Green Party? With PSL, uh, how many states does PSL have ballot access in currently? And is there a strategy in place to get more ballot access, uh, particularly for your campaign? Well, you know that you have to basically file to be able to get ballot access every time you run. And so that you had access in a, in a given moment, like, for example, in COVID, during COVID in 2020, um, we were able to get the state of Illinois. Now, Illinois has uh, lifted 
it lifted restrictions during COVID, but those restrictions have been put back in place uh, after COVID, which is, you know, it's important to be able to say that as well, that there are many obstacles for people to be able to get on ballots. New York City is 45,000 signatures. And obviously you got to double that up. You got to get at least 90, 95,000 because there's a process of verifying signatures. And so this is also a time to be able to expose that, that as much as, again, this country talks about democracy, it doesn't allow for third party options to be able to have the same type of advance advantages and privileges than the corporate duopoly has. Um, we were able to get during the 2020 uh, presidential campaign, 15 states. Um, the party has grown significantly since 2020, precisely because of all the, um, the, upri the uprisings that happened, but also there were a lot of things happening during the 2020 year. Um, a lot of people left the Bernie campaign demoralized when he ceded to the Democratic Party, the co most conventional pieces of the, of the Democratic Party, and they buried his campaign. And so a lot of young people were demoralized and, and um, a lot of young people joined the PSL during that time. And so we are in a stronger position to be able to uh, get more access this time around. Um, and again, I think the experience of petitioning, the experience of campaigning, the experience of getting some of the comrades uh, who again joined during the 2020 experience, 2020 year, um, will definitely expand and strengthen the party um, more than, than it already is. And so I'm really excited for, for that process. Um, and, I, and there's a lot of excitement from the membership and, and our allies and, and other organizations that are surrounding the, the party right now. Sounds good. So I want to bring up your, your platform here because I did share this on the show before and people were really interested in your particular platform. One of the things that really stood out to me is first and foremost, end capitalism before it ends us. And I think, you know, obviously you are a socialist as a socialist. I think it is very important to address the issue with capitalism, uh, whether you're running for, for office or not. But this one here sees the biggest 100 corporations and create a new economy for the people. Can we talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, we totally can. I mean, I think, one very, very recent example of just the dysfunctionality and the mediocrity of our government is all these conversations around the potential shutdown that is gonna happen. Neither party actually comes up with the real solution, which is basically the money is being held in corporations. Like they're having all these different discussions around where to cut and how to cut and Ultimately, the trillions of dollars that are being held hostage by all these corporations could potentially solve a lot of the problems that society faces in, in, in this country. Um, cut, you know, in addition to cutting or seizing what those corporations have held hostage from the people, you also have the money that has been allocated to the Pentagon. So they do this political theory every so often, th this political theater every so often, where they're like, we need to basically make poorer people poorer. <laughs> we need to figure out every way, shape, and form to save capitalism. But the nev there's never a question about saving the people. Yep. And so when we talk about seizing the biggest 100 corporations, we're talking about money that belongs to the people. We're talking about corporations that are, are connected to the cost of inflation. Gas prices are driving this, inf this inflation. And a lot of these car corporations are connected to that. When we're talking about the healthcare issues that we face, the, the lack of access to quality and affordable healthcare, which is, should be universal healthcare. Everybody should have a right to access healthcare. A lot of these corporations are connected to health insurances, are connected to pharmaceuticals. What would yep. happen if we take all that wealth and redistribute it in a way that makes sense for people to be able to live with dignity? We, we live in the wealthiest country in the world, the wealthiest country. 
Um, and we could talk about how it became the wealthiest through theft, through extraction, through exploitation. It is the wealthiest country and poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in this country. And so no one can say that there is not a way of solving the issue of poverty in this country. There is not the will and there is not the interest on behalf of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party because they serve profit. And so I think, again, for us in our platform, talking about seizing, it might sound like, you know, harsh and crazy and radical. But when you talk to people in the streets, when you talk to people in communities, when you talk to people, your neighbor, and you you are able to share that there is so much wealth that is produced by workers in this country. And we're not mm -hmm. even getting, we're not even getting scraps. You have CEOs that are boasting about getting $30 million, you know, while you have comrades, workers, UAW, union leaders that are striking because they can't afford to live. And so, again, it's not seizing just like taking away. No, it's taking back. It's taking back the wealth that we've produced. And that can't sound and it won't sound radical or crazy to working class people who know what it means to wake up early in the morning and leave your energy your time, your, you know, make all levels of sacrifices so that other people get wealthy based off your exploitation. It does not sound as radical as we may think. That's right. Even when we talk about uh, the New Deal, which a lot of people like to, to brag about, uh, the New Deal wasn't about saving the people. It was about saving capitalism. And that's, that's a piece right. I feel like that people often leave out. So you brought up healthcare. I did have a question about that on your platform. I noticed it said quality healthcare. And when I showed this to the audience the first time, the question that a lot of people had was, well, does that mean universal healthcare or does that mean just increasing the quality that we have? So I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that as well. We've always talked about healthcare as a human right. Everyone should have access to free healthcare. Um, Right now, the majority of people that actually have access to health insurance are people that are working, people that are able, you know, through their employer to get health care. It becomes really difficult for people to actually buy and maintain having access to health care. And so there is a question of quality, but there's also the question of access to health care as a human right. And so it's something that the party believes in wholeheartedly, and it's possible. It is, it's not like it's not possible, it's completely possible to do it. And it's, it, you know, it, the question is what it is that we are divesting from and what it is that we are investing in. And we have, since the, or like since capitalism has been uh, a way of organizing society, the reality is that the basic human rights for the majority of people have been denied. And so, you know, mm -hmm. it is access to health care for all. And it is quality health care for all as well. OK, because the reason why I was asking is because some people, particularly those of us that came from like the Medicare for all, you know, either organizations or uh, mm -hmm. protests, so to speak, they may see that and they may wonder, well, does that mean Medicare for all? Does that does Claudia support universal health care across the board? But it, it sounds like you do that. You obviously yeah. support uh, Medicare for all. That's that's awesome. I think that's really good. And I think this piece here is also important. Overthrow the dictatorship of the rich build a democracy that serves the working class. So this is something that you already kind of touched on a little bit, but we do not have a political party in this country that really amplifies the workers and, and their voices. And so you see a mm -hmm. lot of companies going on strike right now, a lot of people trying to unionize, like start a union uh, because their voices are not heard. And I think that this is something that needs to happen. And I noticed you said here, the United States needs a new system of government to replace the current one designed to maintain the dictatorship of the billionaires over everyone else. Let's let's talk a little bit about that, because I, I always scream about the billionaires, because I don't think a lot of people realize just just how much wealth they actually have. I mean, it's trillions of dollars. We're talking about trillions of dollars, literally 
like the amount of money that some families, and we're talking about just a few families or certain individuals have, are is, is more wealth than a lot of, if not the majority of women of Africa combined. That is crazy to think about it in that way. Like the majority, and Africa is a continent. It's pretty big. The majority of African women don't have combined the wealth that let's say the top five billionaires in this country have. And now we have trillionaires. And so it's not that there isn't enough money again to solve the very issues that we have as a society is that the wealth has been accumulated by those who have exploited people through generations. You know, in this country alone, you have 160 million people who are living in or near poverty. That's near half of the population. 40.5 million that say that it's very difficult to live from paycheck to paycheck. That is crazy in the wealthiest country in the world. And again, you know, the CEOs, they've been very blatant in the last couple of you know, years to talk about how much money they're making and how the working class is becoming more confident and they need to crush that confidence because people are just resisting the, 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 the very reality of being exploited. And so we need to, they talk, you know, the ruling class in this country talks about authoritarianism and they talk about regimes and they talk about dictatorship. But the biggest dictatorship that we have is the rule of capitalism in this country. The rule of the trillionaires, of the billionaires, of the corporations, of Wall Street, finance capital. Like that is the dictatorship that we have. And so, you know, there's there's very little um, that they could they could have moral to talk about in this country. The ruling class has no morality. They have no sense of respect for the life of people and the planet. And so I think we need to stop respecting them a little more. We really need to become irreverent. We really need to become disrespectful about the way that we talk about how they treat the majority of people in this country and the world. Well said. Another thing that you mentioned here is in the rule of money and lock up the corporate elites. Uh, this is a, a piece I think that, you know, oftentimes it does not happen. Uh, we see rich people get away with a lot of crimes. One of the things that really stood out to me here is that you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein, which I think is a perfect example. Uh, they still don't want to mention the people that are in that that black book of his that were the clients. Those people are still very much protected. How would you if you were president? What would you do in particular in reference to, let's say, that Jeffrey Epstein case in that black book? Would you go after the clients? Would you call for their names to be released? I think, Sabrina, like there is. So I want to take a, a step back. I think that Ep Epstein was not is not an individual. <laughs> he is the result of a very sick society. And in that sick society, there's Trump. There's Biden, there's Giuliani, and there's many others. There's war criminals, right? And we need to understand how the law operates too. The law wasn't created for them. The law that exists in this country was created to be imposed, again, on the majority of people, which is mostly those who can't afford to be free. And so I think when, you know, the, the, the question of how would I, how would I have dealt with, <laughs> I think is, is, is a good question. And it speaks to a structural and systemic thing. Um, and a reorganization of the so-called justice system in this country, a reorganization of what the purpose is for organisms like the police department. Like the, the NYPD alone, the NYPD alone has put up about $60 million only on misconduct. Mm -hmm. $68 million. That's a whole lot of money that could be put into education that could be rather than dealing with these cops that are out there harassing people and trying to get their summons out. 
So like, I think it's a, it's a structural thing. It's an organizational thing. And the simple answer would be, of course, we would go and persecute those people that were part of enabling and participated in those levels of abuses. But I think we need to think about creating a society that doesn't produce elements like him. Mm. A society that understands that if you do that, there's repercussions. Because none of these people, like I said, have any level of respect. They don't care about anyone or anything if it's not money, if it's not capital, and if it's not exploitation. And they, they laugh at humiliation. They laugh at violence when it comes to being violent against those people who they don't consider human, which is the majority of humanity. And so I think it's a question of, of uprooting and reorganizing the society in a way that it serves the majority of the people and doesn't necessarily see a title or a position to be able to hold people accountable. Well said. Uh, this is a big one for a lot of people that watch this show. Cut the military budget by 90%. And I noticed you gave an actual percentage here. Uh, peace, not war with China and Russia. So I do know also you have an event coming up, the Peace in Ukraine event in D.C. October 3rd. I'll actually be there on the ground covering that live. So I hope I get to, to speak to you in person. But uh, this is a big one with a lot of people in this particular audience, we're tired of this war with Ukraine. We're tired of the defense budget continuing to increase over $860 billion at this point. We're tired of these wars. And at the same time, we do not want to have any type of conflict with Russia or China. You know, we don't want to get closer and closer to a nuclear war. If you were president, how would you handle the military industrial complex, in particular in reference to foreign policy? I mean, I think it's important to, to know, well, I'll start by saying this. The Party for Socialism and Liberation is an anti-imperialist party, which means that we stand against imperialist wars. And we know the history of the United States in its attempt to build, build its empire, the mechanisms and the instruments it has created precisely to expand its reach and to continue to basically steal, because that's what they've done, to steal resources that do not belong to the United States of America and deny other countries the possibility of developing in a way that respects their sovereignty. That's historic. If you look into history, there's many, many Guatemala in 54. You have, you know, the coup in Chile in 73. You have its interventions and its support for colonial forces in Africa. Like you have the Middle East with Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, like, come on, we have the history and we cannot put a blind eye on that. That is there for history to be able to, you know, absolve those of, those of us who are anti-imperialists. All you have to do is look at that. Over the last 20 years, the US government has spent at the very least $21 trillion in war. At the very least, over the, over the last 20 years. And if you tell me what can we use that amount of money for, for many things, but I'll take one thing that the Biden administration promised, which was student debt. Student debt is at $1.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. We're talking about $21 trillion. And that's probably not even, you know, the, this is a number as of 2022. We're not even considering the billions of dollars that have gone on this proxy war on Ukraine. As much as the United States talks about, you know, um, wanting to save democracy or wanting to build democracy or humanitarian whatever, they do not give a flying F about Ukrainians. And actually they speak about it in the most devilish, the most disgusting way. They talk about not having US soldiers die in that war. And it's easy because the ones that are dying are Ukrainians and Russians. And so the United States just sits back 
while they watch this war happen and they finance this war to be able to expand NATO. And if we know geopolitics enough, we know that they've been trying to get at Russia to be able to also get to China, to be able to control that part of the world. And because they also see and know what we should also see and know, and that is that the United States empire is in decline. And it's in decline because the majority of people in this world have stood up and fixed their backbone really well to say, we're not going to take neoliberal projects anymore, and we're not going to take U.S. imperialism anymore. And so you see the, this revolt and revolutionary processes happening in Africa, but you also see, him, see them here in Latin America and the Caribbean, people that are coming together to build a different type a different type of governance worldwide that is based on collaboration and respect. The United States has never historically intervened in any conflict, any conflict in the world with negotiations in their head, with equality or equity in their head, with respect to other people's and nations processes. It has always entered conflict to be able to gain a level of advantage and extract. And when it's done that, it leaves countries like Libya with a destroyed infrastructure, with it political chaos, with levels of insecurity and instability that don't allow people to survive the type of climate crises that the world has experienced. And then they have the audacity to get on X or get on social media and talk about, we pray for Libya? You all destroyed it. Yep. And so we know what imperialism does. And I think, again, our desire is to be able to reclaim the historical memory for folks and with folks to say that we are in, we're anti-imperialist. We are pro the development of relationships that are based on the basis of collaboration and solidarity. And that doesn't mean that we don't, in fact, it means wholeheartedly that we care about the people in Ukraine and we care about the people in Russia. And we don't want wars to happen. Specifically, these wars are instigated by the United States of America, which is the empire that is killing humanity across the globe. And so for us is, is you know, what would we do? We would destroy instruments of war like NATO, like AFRICOM, like the Southern Command, we would shut down the 800 and plus, because right now there's about a thousand of them, military bases across the, across the globe. We would reestablish relationships with nations that are based, again, on collaboration, on negotiations, on conversations. We would definitely expand the thinking of a lot of the nations in this continent that talk about creating a peace zone, creating a peace zone in this continent. Mexico is engaged in that process. You know what I'm saying? Not only is Mexico engaged in that process, so is Cuba, so is Brazil, you know? And, and they talk about these nation states and, and these countries as if they are the ones that we should be afraid of. Listen, the people we should be afraid of are in the Pentagon. They are in the White House. They are in Congress because they are the ones that are promoting war in this, in this world. And so we, we, we cut, we were to cut the billions, the trillions of dollars that we spend in war, we wouldn't have a, a housing crisis in this country. We wouldn't Sorry. have houselessness in this country. We would not have people having to decide whether they're going to put gas in their car to make it to work or they're going to stay home and deal with other stuff. Those are the live decisions people need to make. Not Biden, not Trump, none of these folks from the Republicans' parties or the Democrats are having to fee like feel or deal with those decisions on the daily. None of them. And so why do we put our faith and why do we put our fate in the hands of those people. We have to we have to change the way that we operate in this country. 
Those are very good points, Claudia. I want to hear a little bit more about uh, your background. I, if I remember correctly, you're from the Bronx, correct? I am. I'm from yeah. the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. the Bronx. So <laughs> I, I, one of the questions that I have, because I'm pretty sure as you can imagine, this one has come up. A lot of people are very uh, upset with the progressive members, or I guess they're not progressive anymore, but the squad, for example. They feel like, obviously, they're not holding up their end of the bargain. They're not really fighting for us, et cetera. When you look at someone in particular like AOC, and I'm going to use AOC here because she lived in the Bronx at one point or another, what do you feel that someone like her is not doing correctly right now as a member of Congress? And if you were in that position, what would you do uh, differently? And then also we can hear a little bit more about your background, because I think some people a lot of people this time around, and I've, I've heard from mm -hmm. the audience often, a lot of people this time around, they're very uh, hesitant. They are less trusting, like, and they, you know, they've been this way towards Peter Dow came onto the show and people were very, you know, uh, defensive, uh, so to speak, because people just don't want to go through this again, uh, where there's mm -hmm. people running on progressive issues and then they just, they kind of just cave to the Democratic Party. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your background and, and what would you do differently if you were in that position? Well, first, I, I want to say that, and, and people don't need this from me, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I validate those feelings. I validate those feelings of, of cautiousness, of, you know, even cynicism. Because people fall into that, you know. Um, and it, it, it doesn't come from, you know, thin air. It comes from the real experience of putting energy, time, and effort into processes that then funnel you into the structures that oppress you. And that's very disheartening. And that's very disappointing. And so I want to just raise that those feelings are real and they're valid. I think it's a little different when you're not running as a personality or as an individual. That's why I started saying, I am part of a party and I'm under a party discipline. And to say a corporate duopoly party, <laughs> um, like the Democrats and the Republicans, we know who they respond to. And they know, and we know, also know what their party line is. Um, the Party for Socialism and Liberation has a membership of working class people. People who work in Amazon, folks that are teachers, folks that are doing community organizing work in nonprofits, folks that are doing all sorts of, of work, again, and know what the stressors are of being poor and working class within a capitalist society. And those are the people that I'm accountable to. I myself was born in the poorest congressional district in the United States, which is the South Bronx. My parents, are both immigrants from the Dominican Republic who came after interventions of the United States into the Dominican Republic in the 1960s and came basically following the traces of all the hopes, aspirations, and material forces that were stolen from them by US government. And so they landed in, you know, in the United States, in the Bronx, um, the middle child of, of three, we're all working class, my parent, my my mom was a, an educator. She worked in the Department of Education in New York City for over 30 years. So I saw her waking up every morning at 5 a.m. and getting home at 6. Um, and still, when she got home, she helped us do homework and then went on to prepare her lesson plans and do her work. Um, and my father was a construction worker and a potter um, in buildings where rich people lived. And these were the same people that said that poor people were poor because they didn't work enough. And so I also grew up with a real consciousness of what it meant to be poor, even though my parents did everything to have all of my needs covered. Um, the effort that it took to have that was something that I was able to see every day from a, from a very young age. Um, you know, so I come from a community. If you haven't been to the South Bronx, maybe, you know, if whenever you're in New York, I'm done. Okay. Well, it's yeah. very, you know, very Caribbean, very black. Um, 
And so I also grew up understanding that I was a black Caribbean woman um, in a society that's highly patriarchal and highly racist. And so my own experience of, of living <laughs> within capitalism um, made me understand the, the threat that it meant for me to be inactive to not get involved, to not be in a collective space. And so I started doing organizing when I was 13 years old. And I started doing uh, organizing within a church space that practiced liberation theology. So, um, you know, folks from the, the Latin American Caribbean tradition, so Camilo Torres, uh, Edel Camara, and all these different theologians that wrote about the need to center the poor and working class. And in that community, there were a lot of people who were atheists. The majority of my church community were actually atheists. They were exiles from El Salvador, exiles from Guatemala, folks that came because there again had been U.S. interventions in their countries. Um, people who had been, per, you know, persecuted in Colombia because of U.S. corporations like Coca-Cola. Um, there were also folks that were engaged in in Black liberation movements. So. I was able to connect with folks that were doing uh, political prisoner work and, and worked in, in several campaigns around Mumia, around other, you know, Leonard Peltier and other folks, um, mm -hmm. and continue to do that work still. But, but I grew up in, in that space, folks that were able to bring forth the struggle to free Palestine, um, that made me understand their relationship uh, that was imposed on Puerto Rican people, making it a colony, making it the last colony in this continent. And so, you know, the level of consciousness was not only one that was based on class consciousness and understanding where I was coming from as a working class person, as a working class Black Caribbean woman, but also understanding that the working class is global just as capitalism is global. And so understanding that internationalism was the antithesis to US imperialism and that we needed to work on building solidarity projects. And so the church had solidarity projects with Cuba, had solidarity projects with Venezuela, um, had solidarity projects and campaigns that were connected to the MST in Brazil, um, solidarity projects with communities in Oaxaca, Mexico. and so. My community, which is very local, had a very clear understanding of what the call was in terms of people's liberation and the many different identities that the working class possesses and how all of these things are connected to the struggle against capitalism, against imperialism, um, and against those oppressions that come and are birthed from that. White supremacy, patriarchy, you know, homophobia, xenophobia, um, it was very hard for me to come into the early 2000s and see the world kind of shifting and seeing that there was so much fragmentation of issues. LGBTQ, L LGBTQA communities here, immigrant struggles here, um, you know, and, and it was just so fragmented. And it's something that, again, comes from a vacuum. It comes from a vacuum of orientation it comes from a vacuum of political organization, um, which is not the same as other type of formation. Because when we're talking about the formation of a political party, is a way in which all these different issues are synthesized within one space. And so bringing it back to the PSL, all of our comrades, all of the members need to be connected to a struggle. And so we have folks that are doing work around police brutality, but there are also folks that are doing work against the war. And there are folks that are doing work around housing. And there are folks that are doing work around reproductive justice. But all of this is synthesized within the party because it's one struggle. We don't see them fragmented. And that's what was so interesting to me. And that's what was so um, significant to me that I did not have to break myself into different organizations based on my identities. And so, you know, that's a little bit about me, I guess. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I know like as an organizer myself, like I'm like a part of one organization for one issue and maybe a part of another organization for another issue. So I totally understand where you're coming from there. I want to dive into the climate issue. Save the planet from capitalism. 
To deal with the disastrous effects of the climate crisis, society must urgently transform the way we produce energy, grow food, and move around the world. The main obstacle mm -hmm. standing in our way is private profit and the system that values quarterly revenue over the survival of human civilization. So one of the things I, I noticed here, it says fossil fuel corporations should immediately be taken over by the public and repurposed to generate renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about that? And the reason why I'm pointing that part out in particular is because under save the planet from capitalism, for me, if the first thing that I would want to see is in the wars, because the military industrial complex is the largest, most single polluter of the world. So when some people, when they see this and they see save the planet from capitalism, and we start to talk about the climate issue, and then it goes into fossil fuels, this is where mm -hmm. some people will feel that this is something that the Democratic Party is saying. This is what AOC was just recently saying at the climate march in New York City. So we can talk around the, the strategy about this a little bit. Okay. Well, I think, you know, just as I always say, and I forgot to, uh, when you asked about AOC and other progressive folks, I'll just say this quickly and then I'll get into that because I think that that is important. I think that the key aspect of it is that, again, these are individuals and they're getting talking points. Who they're getting talking points from is the question <laughs> and it's questionable <laughs> um, because they don't necessarily have their feet in the ground. They're not doing the organizing work. They're not connected to people that are actually hurt by these processes. And so again, when you're part of a party and you're part of an organization, you're not necessarily connecting to talking points alone. It's the experience of people. It's pretty much palpable in what you have to say. So I'll just say that. I think in terms of the, the platform itself, it's important for us not to see it kind of in different elements. All of these things are threaded to get it together. And where we're talking about, you know, military spending, you are you are completely correct. You know, the United States is the biggest polluter. And it's the biggest polluter precisely because it wages war against the planet and humanity. Period. That is right. Um, and it is precisely through that process that we have um, accelerated the climate crisis. And we also have people that are cri climate crisis deniers. Like they deny <laughs> that, 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 that that is a reality and that people are actually experiencing it. Um, I think it's, you know, again, important to see all these different elements because even if we talk about seizing the 100 corporations, that also mm -hmm. speaks to the question of the climate crisis and what corporations do throughout the world. The level of garbage and toxic that they put into other people's land, you know, the land that they take. All of these things are part of that as well. And so when we're talking about that point specifically and we're saying what we're saying in the platform in that way is not to be seen isolated from everything else that we're saying. It is basically seeing the threat of all of these different issues that at the very root have capitalism and U.S. imperialism stamped on it. And so I just want to say that. <laughs> well said, well said. Uh, one of the other questions I have for you. Uh, so recently, a number of candidates have come forward and say that they agree with reparations. Now, RFK Jr. said he agrees with reparations, but then he also said he doesn't agree with cash reparations. So I want to hear in reference of your particular campaign, do you agree with that there should be some type of monetary uh, reparations for American descendants of slavery? I mean, in the platform, we say, we say that there should be, and we also understand that that alone is not enough. Because we can, I mean, it could happen. We gain power, we seize these corporations, we give folks cash, their checks, but what does that say in terms of where to like what they're investing in? That's not enough. <laughs> um, what they're investing in, are they putting that money back into the corporations that exploit workers? Are they putting back that money into the system that continues to take away their rights? And so it's a role, like when we think about reparations, it goes beyond 
for us, it goes way beyond the question of cash. It talks again about the reorganization of society and what, how is society organized in a way that benefits those who have been historically marginalized? We mm -hmm. understand and know that capitalism, the capitalism we know today is standing on the grounds of slavery and colonialism. Slavery and colonialism were the down payment for the system in which we live today. And so there is a historic debt to black and indigenous people. But that debt again, expands even beyond the United States of America. That's why I say all of these things are connected because how about the extraction and the exploitation of African workers by US corporations? So all of these things are connecting. When we're talking about reparations, we're talking about the transformation of a society that allows people, especially those who have been historically exploited and marginalized, Black and Indigenous communities, to thrive, to live with dignity, to be able to understand, you know, themselves in the context of a larger society and have a saying in how that society is shaped, which is what our, our ancestors were robbed of the possibility, the potential of being able to develop not only themselves, but develop the society that could actually allow them to live to the yeah. full of their capacity. That's also part of the reparations we're talking about. So yes, we're talking about, you know, the monetary piece, we're talking about um, being able to, to give folks, uh, you know, but it's minimal. If we're talking about cash or we're talking about checks, whatever anyone from our historically marginalized communities receives is minimal. Mm -hmm. Considering the generational trauma, the theft of our people from their land, the displacement of our people that continues, the number of people imprisoned in this country that are still imprisoned for things that, that a lot of them shouldn't be imprisoned for. And so it's a lot, it's so much. How can you possibly put a number to that? So yes and, you know, it can't be yes and that's, that's it. It has to be yes and, and we should, you know, I think part of the campaign and part of this process and part of putting the, the platform out in this way, in a way that might seem radical to many is to embolden us. For a long time, we've literally taken the, the, the least because yep. they've told us that's, that's as good as we could do. Well, hell no. You, we could do better. If that's the least you can't do, then we could do better. And we should be bold enough to take, uh, take it up to us to be able to build a society that allows us to live and thrive. There's no reason why we shouldn't. Well said. So Claudia, one of the questions that I know a lot of people are going to ask, and they asked Dr. West this question as well. Are you in it to the end? In other words, is there a possibility that you could drop out of the race and endorse Joe Biden? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I would have added something to the hell no, but I'm respecting the platform. Hell no. I mean, it's not, it's, it's something that um, we've never done as a party. And I'm very proud of that. We've been very consistent politically. Um, again, I've myself been doing organizing work and have been in, in socialist politics since I was 13. I'm 42. It's not about to change now. Um, and it's definitely not about to change for Biden or, or anyone from the Republican party. This is, it's unconceivable. It wouldn't happen. And even if we don't, you know, I'm in it to the end, to the very end. And regardless of whatever the outcome is in terms of, you know, what, wherever we get, the, the idea behind this is so much more than the electoral process. Um, the idea behind this is to build political organization, is to contribute to building an independent movement of the working class in this country. The stakes are high, you know, and the stakes are high for building people power 
in this country because we need it. Because again, if we do not put an end to the society as we know it, to the organization of society as we know it, I mean, it, it's going to be the regression of many decades of work that a lot of our people have lived, died, and been imprisoned for. It's so much more than just getting elected. We need to build people power. We need to build political organization so that we come back stronger and stronger and accumulate the forces necessary to actually fight how we need to fight in this country. Well, Claudia, one more thing for you here. I know you were a co-founder of the People's Forum, and this is something I want to show people as well, because uh, especially the Marxist piece here, I think is important. The People's Forum is a socialist organization that acts as a project incubator from its location in New York City. The forum hosts events, readings, operates a cafe and a library and publishes various cultural works and media. It has collaborated with a number of radical left and Marxist philosophers and activists. And so I think this piece right here is incredibly important. The Marxist piece, and this is not to say that everybody has to be a Marxist, but I think it's important that you have that theory to go along with the work that you are doing. That's right. That's right. I mean, for us, it was really uh, necessary to be able to reclaim the socialist and Marxist traditions that the United States has, because we have that tradition. The, the capitalist state has done its part to bury it. Um, it mm -hmm. has created infrastructure and organizations that uh, openly attack socialism, communism. Um, and I think it's important for us to be, again, able to reclaim that history, to uplift that politic, that theory that has allowed for people to survive and to advance struggle in this country. I mean, a lot of the advances that were made in the 1930s during the Great Depression, it was because of communists. It was socialists that were doing that work in unions, folks that were organizing in different different spaces. Um, you had people like Paul Robeson, people how, like that we idealize, the people that we say they're legendary, and we completely depoliticized them. Paul Robeson was a communist. W.E.B. Du Bois was a communist. Claudia Jones was a communist. And we could go down the line. You know, there's so many. And people, again, you know, when there's birthdays or when there's like death anniversary, we'll put them up. And, and and that's great. And we should know who these folks were in relationship to political organization. In which historical moments did they develop? We shouldn't think of communism and Marxism as the boogeyman because it's not actually. Right. And Marxism as a science has been utilized all over the world. Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and in the United States of America. And what it's done, what it has done is allow people to perceive and relate to the world in a way that is based on history, on an analysis of the economy and politics of the shifts that have ha has happened historically. And so for us, it was very important to be able to create a space to reclaim that history, to reclaim the values that come from it. The values are not that of individualism. The values are those of building collectivity of building democratic spaces, which means that sometimes what you want won't happen because it's been a democratic process and there's been conversations. And as an individual, you submit to the discipline that was the process of building democracy, which is not an understanding of democracy in this country. And so there's so many different aspects, you know, the cultural piece, reclaiming, you know, people's creativity, Sometimes because we understand art to be within the frame of the elite, we don't think we're creative and we are the most creative people. Working class people are so creative and resilient. I mean, we figure out how to live every day with yes. the minimal amount of things. <laughs> and so we are highly creative and it's kind of like encouraging communities and create, uh, encouraging young people specifically to, to be able to, to use their creativity to advance struggle. And so the People's Forum is a, is, you know, is a dream of many years, is the accumulation of a lot of experiences in organizing, in political education, experiences that are not only you know, local to New York City or nationally to the United States, but, the, but it, it's international. 
Um, and the People's Forum is connected to a lot of international struggles and a lot of uh, different progressive and revolutionary processes. And we have had um, the great privilege and honor to host a lot of our comrades from South Africa, from Venezuela, from Cuba, from Brazil, from Mexico. I mean, you name it, folks that have come, that have taught, that have done lectures, that have done events. Um, we're, you know, there's a, we're hosting, or the forum is hosting, because I took a leave of absen absence, but the forum is hosting tomorrow a whole conference on sanctions that we've, you know, the forum has been working with, um, with the National Lawyers Guild and other organizations in that process. It's been a whole year of, of a tri people's tribunal, you know, just putting up like the many countries that have been sanctioned by the United States and the cost of those sanctions in, in, in the people in those countries. It's over 70 countries that the United States has sanctioned. It's strangling the economy of these countries and then pointing to them and saying they're not doing enough because of course the United States is strangling the economy until it makes a scream like Nixon said once and they, they have a civil, a, a, you know, a civil war in these countries. That's what they're aiming for. And so I think the, the space does a lot in bringing people together, bringing young organizers together, not only to learn, but also to strategize, to build projects collectively, um, and to dream of a better world in the construction, in the process of building it. Not just to dream it, but like in the material sense, how do we do our work day to day to be able to get to the world that we want. Um, and we're building this with and for the working class. So it's great. So one question I do have, because this was brought up my way, it says the People's Forum has been a recipient of over 18 million through donor advised fund provider, Goldman Sachs Philanthropy Fund. So I did mm -hmm. want to ask about that, the connection mm -hmm. between the People's Forum and Goldman Sachs. So there's a lot of, um, we live within a capitalist system. That's the first thing. And I think people would be naive and I think not understanding the mechanisms in which we have to exist if we want to do the work that we need to do. We are a nonprofit organization, like any other community-based organization. We do have a difference and is that we're explicitly Marxist. And we can be explicitly Marxist only because we had the initial support from a comrade, a comrade who had enough money after selling his company to donate that money without asking anything from us, without putting deliverables in connection to our work. This person was able to say, you're gonna have this fund this, and it's gonna be here and you're gonna be able to operate however you understand you need to base on the conditions of the United States. And there's no instruction from that funder. If you look at other nonprofits, there's a lot of instructions and there's a lot of deliverables. But in order for us to be able to receive that money, I mean, I can't just have it in my house. <laughs> it can't just be in a regular, it has to be somewhere. And it has to be somewhere where there's a potentiality of being able to increase that money as well. And so what we have done, and we've been very intentional about doing, is making sure that that money is not utilized for the mechanisms of war that we're also consistently attacking. We've been very, the level of integrity in which we've utilized that money is very telling if you follow the work. I've been a, a very strong believer, and again, for the last 32 years of work, that what you do is telling of who you are. And so if you follow the work of the People's Forum, you know what we're doing and you know what we're about. Right, but the thing is that people will see, and I'm, I'm a big one that the money is a really big thing for me. So what people will see though, is that they'll see that there is that connection to Goldman Sachs. And I totally understand that it's a nonprofit. I totally get that. I know you got to get the funding from somewhere, but to give you a more- but they're, uh, not fun they're not funding us. Let me correct you. Goldman and Sachs is not funding us. There were funds that were given to us to be hold in, held in that fund so that we're able to extract that money and do the work that we do. They're not funding us. There's more material, and I would actually invite your listeners to look for it online. We ourselves put out um, through 
X, I guess, Twitter, a whole thread around this. This has been a question that folks, including folks in our membership, because we have over 200 members of the People's Forum. And so we've had to deal with this internally to our community and also externally. And pretty, like in a very confident, but also in a very humble way, I would ask folks to do their research. There is um, there's a comrade who was an ex-Black Panther who was also part of the League of Revolutionary Workers, who was able to build a company of technology and then sell it. We've never received donations from anyone else, um, aside from private donations for the work that we do. And so I get the caution and I get the questions. And I think that there's a level of understanding how the capitalist society works in a way um, the obstacles also that it places for organizations like us to do the work, to have to use their mechanisms to be able to survive. And I will point people out again, point people out again to the five years of work that we have and the consistency of our politics. Right. I, I understand that. But from a personal example, for example, Rome, my comrade from Revolutionary Blackout Network, has a nonprofit called Tour for the Poor. We have RBN chapters in our respective areas across the country, and we are not connected to any Goldman Sachs philanthropy. Thund We're not connected to any corporation or any corporate power. What So what to speak. So like we get our funding directly from the people. So when people, if I'm doing a fundraiser, I say I'm trying to raise money to do this event, it comes directly from the people. There's no uh, attachment to, to a Goldman Sachs philanthropy. So the thing is, is that people are going to see this and it is going to raise red flags for people, particularly for a socialist or Marxist group. Well, I'll say this to you and other folks that think along those lines. There's only but so much you could do when you have a nonprofit that is solely being funded by local like communities. And you, sh and you know this, I worked in nonprofit for a long time. There's a lot of limitations. If the idea, if the vision is to do something to the scale as the People's Forum has done it for the last five years, which is also providing infrastructure for organizations that are precisely that. Organizations that are member, you know, member uh, paid or member covered, organizations that don't have physical spaces, organizations that have been displaced by gentrification, organizations that come from across the globe and need a space to be able to hold meetings and hold events. Um, there's a we there's a, there there was a need to be able to rethink. Um, how we would organize it. And there was, and, and I'll say this, you, you have this nonprofit, which is commendable and is, is good. But if we think about the majority of nonprofits in this, in this country and where their money comes from, regardless of how good work they do, they do come from foundations that are very much connected to the exploitation. And that's where I go with the limitations, with the deliverables, with the, basically cutting the budget at a certain point where people are advancing the work or keeping people in this cycle of having to look for money and look for money and look for money and not being able to do everything that they feel and want and need to do in the practicality of it. And so I get what you're saying and I get the red flags. And I would also uh, caution us to the way in which we've been taught to think about this question of transparency, which is not necessarily the question of political organizations. Martin Luther King and other folks were financed by wealthy people to do the work that they did. And maybe they didn't have to go through the process of doing it through a Goldman and Sachs, but they were financed by other comrades to be able to advance the work. Marx needed, <laughs> needed angles. And so we, there are folks that come to that amount of money and are able to do the work again without any strings attached. And that's what we've done. There has right, not been I, any. <laughs> right. But I think the problem is, Claudia, is that, again, the first thing that we see when we go to the platform is seize the biggest 100 corporations, create a new economy for the people. 
But then if you go to the people's forum, then we see there's that attachment to the corporations that you're supposed to fight back against. And I'm not, okay. I'm not bringing this, I'm not bringing this up to hurt you. I'm bringing this up just as an FYI, because this will, this will come up come 2024, but, but you know, what I'm, I'd what I'm saying you on, you. Yeah. I'd love to what see I'm you on you. even more bigger platforms. And I'm just bringing these things. When Cornell West was here, I raised awareness to him as well. And if I was able to, to find that and make that connection, what I'm saying is that it will come up again. So people what are going to ask. Yeah. Sabrina, what I'm saying is that that's not new information. <laughs> that's been out and it's been out and it's been discussed publicly. And it's been, there have been articles, the New York Times put out an article. I mean, there has been a lot. And then there's also the question of who is pursuing this information and for what? And if you put that in contrast to the work, then there's obviously a desire to do something else. And that's, that's the only thing I'm saying. You're not hurting me. And I'm, and right. I hope I'm not just coming out like that. Yeah, but and I, I'm I do, not saying know. that it's, it's new. I'm not saying that it's something new. It's just the fact that that is there and you are running for president. And the first thing on the platform is seize the biggest corporation. So people are going to say, how are you going to seize the biggest corporations if you're connected to the corporation? Well, again, that financing, that funding did not, it could have been any other, any other vehicle. Um, and unfortunately that, unfortunately every vehicle in this capitalist system is connected to something. And so we are doing, or, the forum is doing the work that it's doing and it has been doing it for five years with a lot of integrity, facing a lot of attacks from the different oppositions. And if it's, and it, and it stood, it has stood really grounded on its politics and its values. And that's something that I'm very proud of because there's a lot of organizations that cannot say the same, regardless of whoever it is financing them. All right. Well, Claudia, 2024, where can people find you, Claudia? How can they can support your uh, campaign? Um, folks could go to votesocialist2024.com. Um, you can follow us on X, Twitter, I don't know these days. Um, we're on Instagram as well. And you could also look up the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, and again, the purpose of this whole process is to be able to encourage people to join political organizations, to join movement work, and to be bolder and courageous because these moments actually require that level of boldness. All right, Claudia, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Bye.